We are going to start this video by going through the volume and pressure changes that occur in the left ventricle during one cardiac cycle. As we talk through these changes, I will graph out the comparison on this graph. So during late diastole, both sets of chambers in the heart are relaxed and the ventricles fill passively with blood. Then when the atria contract during atrial systole, they force a small amount of additional blood into the ventricles. That's why the line's curved. Next, the AV valves close, but the semilunar valves haven't opened yet. And when they do open, the blood is ejected. Lastly, the ventricles relax and pressure in the ventricles falls. So blood falls back into the cusps of the semilunar valves and pushes them closed. The right bottom dot on this graph represents the end diastolic volume, and the left top dot represents the end systolic volume on this graph. So remember that this is talking about the left ventricle specifically, and the whole volume of blood that entered and left the heart represents the stroke volume. Now let's look at a different diagram called a Wigger's diagram, and I'll explain the different parts of it, but keep in mind that mine may not be exactly proportional, so afterwards I'll show one that's a little more accurate. On the top part of the diagram, we have the results of an electrocardiogram graphed. So we can see the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave to compare to the other parts of the diagram that will be drawn later. Next, I'll graph the pressure changes of the left ventricle, the aorta, and the left atrium to compare to each other. So first we have the large pressure change accompanying ventricular systole in the left ventricle. After that, we're going to draw the more subtle changes in the aorta, um, but this importantly shows visually when the left ventricular pressure and the aorta have the same pressure because that's where the heartbeat sounds are created at these intersections. Lastly, we'll graph the atrial pressure, which is much lower than the other two compartments graphed previously. As I said earlier, these points at which the aortic and the ventricular pressures are the same create the lub-dub sounds of the heart, so I'll show these sounds below. Okay, I drew those terribly, but hopefully you get the idea. The very bottom part of the Wigger's diagram shows the volume changes in the left ventricles. I won't take much time to go over that, but you can study all the sections of the Wigger's diagram more on this picture. Moving on, we are going to talk a bit about the intercalated discs that were mentioned in last lab's videos. In between the myocytes in these discs, there are gap junctions, which allow the electrical signal to be propagated through the heart tissue. There are also desmosomes, which act to hold the cells to each other. The unique nature of the cardiomyocytes allow them to contract in a coordinated effort. This is called syncytium, and in cardiac muscles, no summation or fiber recruitment occurs. Let's now talk about the electrical signal and how it leads to cardiac muscle contraction. First, the action potential enters from the adjacent cell. Voltage-gated calcium channels open in the T-tubule and calcium enters the cell. The calcium then induces more calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum through the ryanodine receptor channels. The local release of calcium causes a spark and those summed calcium sparks create a calcium signal. Calcium ions then bind to troponin to initiate contraction of the actin myosin complex. The purple structures I am drawing will represent the myosin, and the red will represent the actin in the contracted form. Relaxation of the actin and myosin happens when calcium unbinds from the troponin. So here again we have the myosin and then the actin, but this time in the relaxed form. So some of the calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum for storage, and another part of the calcium is exchanged out of the cell for the entrance of sodium. So we'll show the pump here at the top. So the calcium will be leaving the cell, and then the sodium will be entering the cell. And then the sodium gradient will be maintained by the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. 